Testing, testing, one, two. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Sorry to stop the interesting conversation, but you know it has to end. Um, welcome. Welcome to the CIFA Conference 2018, and we're going to start with the best bit, which is the housekeeping announcements. Uh, I shall introduce myself first. I'm Peter Hinton. I'm the Chief Executive. Uh, if the fire alarm goes off, strangely enough, we expect it to leave by the fire exits. Two behind you, one over there. There are assembly points on either side of the building, so just head out of whichever door looks appropriate and keep running until someone tells you to stop. Uh, toilets you will already have found downstairs. Phones, could you please put your phone onto silent or throb or something like that so we don't get too many interruptions. And the final piece of housekeeping is just to remind you all, please, to treat colleagues with respect during this conference. So if you find their views particularly unsettling or their person particularly attractive, could you just um, act in a professional manner and think about the uh, feelings of others? I'm sure I don't need to tell you that, but it's probably worth just having that on the record. Um, Today we are insanely going to do a six-headed PowerPoint presentation, so wish us luck. Um, none of us have ever spoken at a race course before, so I say to my colleagues, break a leg. Uh, I'm sure it will go well. Um, we're just going to do one presentation all the way through. Um, we're going to end by talking at some length about CIFA and its activities over the last year and then invite your contributions to a discussion. Um, but before we get to that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, who is Terry Froment from Towergate. Now, Towergate Insurance, Towergate Health have been um, long-time supporters of the Institute. We're very grateful for their sponsorship and their assistance on so many matters. Uh, so. I'm going to hand over now to Terry, and off we go. They're off. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, thank, you, uh, thank you everybody for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, my name is Terry Froman, as uh, Peter mentioned, and I work alongside Tarek at Towergate. Uh, but where Tarek helps you with your commercial uh, insurance needs, I work in our health and protection division, which allow, uh, specialise in providing insurance cover for your most valuable asset, your people. Towergate Health and Protection works in three main areas. The first is health, this is uh, private medical insurance and it's both in the UK and international and for any size of business. Employee benefits such as group life, group income protection, travel dental and all the other ranges of employee benefits and uh, protection. Um, we've chosen to, uh, to partner with Vitality Life to offer business, personal and business protection like key person cover or shareholder protection. Um, I'd just like to show you now a very short video from uh, Sebastian Co, which explains the importance of having business protection. A good business is a healthy business, but it's not a nice to have. It's an absolute essential. Business protection is really important for smaller companies because those that are running those businesses need to know that the people they have in place have got a good chance of being in place this time next year, well and, and healthy. That when it comes to succession planning and thinking about what the next generation looks like, you need to know when you're likely to have to do that. You need to know that you've got the key people in place for some of the key moments in the business. And actually, most employees are actually family people. And the reason that they're good employees is they tend to think of their workforce as a part of the family. So in exactly the same way you'd be worried about the health uh, and well-being of your family, good employees are actually extending that philosophy to the people that they're working alongside. Look, I know from my experience as chair of the organising committee that you were very keen to make sure that the key people at the key moments of the project were there and able to deliver. And that's really also a key concept in succession planning. In athletics, it's a very simple concept. The forward momentum you make in a training program is actually contingent upon the amount of sensible control recovery time you take. 
So it's not just about hard work and training and focus. You really do need that time where you recover. Sometimes it's forced because you're recovering from an injury, but that recovery phase is really important whether you're fit and healthy at that moment as an athlete. And I know I function better when I'm sort of across my health needs than when I'm sliding it to one side and only focusing on should come as any great surprise. Um, the first one, of course, is, is our Chartered Archaeologist plans. Um, the second one is about career progression, and actually they're not two different things at all. They're not separate. This is all part of, of one initiative, um, which is a bit like digging the channel tunnel from both ends, um, my job being to make sure that they meet in the middle, um, so no pressure there. Um, we really want you to come talk to us over the course of the conference about Chartered Archaeologists, your hopes, aspirations, fears, dreams for the future. Um, Rob Lennox, my colleague Rob, is on a stall downstairs. He has a number of posters which explain where we are at the moment in the process and the different ways that you can get in touch with us. Um, and he also has opportunities for you to leave comments on post-it notes, um, which we'll be gathering in at the end of each day and which will help to inform the discussion that we're planning as part of the plenary session on Friday afternoon. There are other ways you can get in touch with us, so there's the hashtag, um, there's a, an email address, you can have a look on the website um, about what we've done so far. You can even write us a letter, I'd love to get a letter for some, for, from somebody about, about Chartered Archaeologists at this stage. So, confident that you. What we want them also to be is recognised, and this isn't about archaeologists talking to archaeologists, this is about recognition outside our profession, and archaeology being recognised as a chartered profession fit for the, the 21st century. Um, so, this is why we're doing it, this is why we want you to get involved, this is why it's really important. We want to improve the external perception of your skills, your profession, um, with the clients and the public that you work with and work alongside. It's about enhancing their confidence in your work, um, strengthening our own processes and informing our own accreditation validation processes, developing the value of CIFA membership to improve our offer to those archaeologists who aren't members at the moment, um, and also to make archaeology more attractive as a profession, to start attracting new people into archaeology. And one of my favourite comments in one of the surveys that we've run so far, um, when we asked respondents to complete the sentence, I think archaeologists should be chartered because, is the person who said, because it will stop my dad asking me when it is I'm going to get a proper job. <laughs> um, this is about making other people see archaeology as a proper job. So, in a nutshell, it's about parity with other professions <clears throat> that you work alongside on a daily basis. Um, it's also about recognition. And, and the, the big thing, this isn't about improving CIFA's profile, although we hope it will. Um, it's about improving your profile and the skills and accreditation that you hold. And that's all about developing our credibility um, and making sure that we have the skills, that you have the skills that you need to deal with all the challenges that you face as, a, as an expanding, at the moment, 21st century profession. So this is a timetable for development. This is a very fluid timetable because it's consultative. We want your views and we will take as long as it takes to make sure that we have all those views and that we've taken them on board and incorporated them into the process. So at the moment, we're consulting on detailed proposals for the assessment of professional competence. And this is really important that you in, engage with that. This is about what defines a child for purpose as we, as we go forward. The other aspects of that process will then be developing the framework for assessment. Um, so how much of 
um, how much of those areas of competence can be assessed through uh, a portfolio of evidence, a statement of competence, how many will be assessed through a professional review, how much we rely on CPD documentation, how much we rely on, on references. Um, so we'll be consulting with members over the spring and summer, own dates here. Um, by the autumn, we would hope to have a suite of documents that we can put out to you as a formal package um, to then formally, formally seek your, your views and that we can discuss with our advisory council and our special interest groups. And then the next stage will then to be to start the formal process of consultation on revised bylaws. Um, that support the Charter, we need to apply to the Privy Council Office to amend the bylaw um, and obviously we will need your approval as members for that revised documentation and we'll need to develop the regulations that support that um, and we envisage that formal consultation potentially happening in January at the moment but as I say it's a very fluid timetable because it will depend a lot on the views and the, the, the responses that we get back from you over the next, the next six months or so. If all goes well, and you're happy, we would hope to take this formal proposal then to an extraordinary general meeting at the CIFA conference this time next year. That's our, that's our best case scenario. So if you're not happy, if the message is go away and think again, or do some more work on different aspects, then we'll take that on board and we can move that date forward. But this is, this is what we're aiming at at the moment. Um, if that approval is granted, then we can submit the petition to the Privy Council Office. We have no idea at that point how long that might take for them to respond. But what we do know is that once we do get a response, and if it's a positive one, we'll need um, a reasonable implementation phase for us to develop um, the, the logistics and the, the, the infrastructure to, to assess this. So we would hope our aspiration is to see the first chartered archaeologists, potentially, if the Privy Council agrees with us, with us um, coming into being around about 2020. That's, that's, the, that's the hope um, and the aim, but a lot depends on this, on this consultation process, and that's, that's in your hands. I'll just run through these because we are on a race course after all. Um, very quickly. Obviously the Chartered Archaeologist process isn't happening in isolation, this is about trying to embed career pathways and trying to support that structure that we've always felt has been a bit lacking in our profession to help people move through um, different levels of responsibility, different grades of CIFA membership. And we hope that this process will benefit all grades of membership. It's not just about those people who might aspire in the very near future to become Chartered themselves, it creates a chartered profession and that should have a knock-on effect whether you're a, a student member, whether you're a, a practitioner, whether you're looking to upgrade to, to, to the next grade up. And for that reason it needs to integrate with the rest of the, the initiatives that we've been involved in. Very quickly, um, we've been working with University Archaeology UK on accrediting uh, academic programmes, degree programmes, and we're hoping that that will be launched later on this year. Um, we've also been doing an awful lot of work on, with Historic England and colleagues on trailblazer apprenticeships in England um, and just start, um, hopefully with the aim of attracting a more, a more diverse workforce in the future and allowing opportunities for a, a greater range of people to get involved in archaeology. So my last slide then is, this is, this is an evolving and developing um, diagram which just helps me to try and keep track a little bit about of these different initiatives and how we see them fitting together. And it's not meant to be seen as a linear thing whereby you might do an, follow an academic route or a vocational route. The idea is that, that um, aspiring archaeologists would move around these different, these different areas, so perhaps doing a, a, a general undergraduate degree and then moving on to an employer graduate training scheme, or perhaps starting out with an MVQ and moving on to a specialist master's. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in there. It's a rapidly changing diagram, and one of, the, one of the, the, the highlights really that I just wanted to end on is the fact that it's already out, out of date as of last week. Um, we've, we heard at the end of last week that we have the final piece in the jigsaw for the level three um, archaeological technician apprenticeship, has just been approved by the Institute of Apprentices. 
Um, and that means that we have all, all the pieces in the jigsaw now to start delivering apprenticeships from September this year, um, which is really great news and, and is, is largely thanks to an awful lot of hard work on the part of historic England colleagues and colleagues on the working groups from, from employers. Um, so that, that's a huge step forward for us. We've been working on this as a group for a long time. Um, so I'm going to leave you on that, that positive note um, and ha hand over to, to Pete. Thank you, Kate. So coming up fast on the inside rail now. Um, uh, that's the, our, our theme. Yeah, there's always one, isn't there? Um, our, our theme is, is about um, collaboration, synthesis, innovation, um, pulling together. Uh, and so I was just going to say a little bit about our, our work with our good colleagues in the National Heritage Agencies. Um, Historic England, first of all, seeing as we're in England, um, we've done a lot of work, informal work with them in partnership this year. Um, dealing with planning reform. Tim, Tim Howard, my colleague, is going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges we have in planning uh, at the moment, but you'll be aware that reform definitely needs those um, inverted commas around it. There's, the planning system is getting streamlined into ever greater complexity, uh, a meandering process that is beginning to form some oxbow lakes in which we may well find ourselves lost, and it's been great to work, particularly with the legal team, at Historic England and know that we're all on the same page and have the same understanding. Um, we're also pleased to continue to be um, supporting the, the placement scheme at Historic England, Historic Environment Placements, uh, part of Kate's work and, and Anna's work on, on the skill side of things and the career side of things. And as uh, Kate mentioned, we're very pleased to work with Historic England on the apprenticeships and very good news last week about that. And, and, and finally, um, we run a series of workshops with Historic England on um, policies for archaeology in the 21st century, um, which, as the queue on behind me says, you can learn more about in here in two and a bit hours' time. So uh, I recommend that to you. And uh, it, uh, our work with Hess has been mainly on the um, Scotland's archaeology strategy, um, which is not Hesse's archaeology strategy, it belongs to the people of Scotland, uh, and the vision statement is behind you. And once again, it's emphasising, as Kate did just now, public benefit, public values. That's the rationale for doing archaeology. Um, there are five aims in the strategy. Aim one is being led by Historic Environment Scotland, but it's kind of got CIFA written all through it like a stick of Brighton rock. Um, it, it's about regulation, it's about quality, it's about ensuring good archaeological outcomes. And we're hoping that with our colleagues from uh, FAME and Algeo Scotland we can uh, develop some workshops to su support that work. Aim 5 is all about innovation and skills. Uh, lots of the uh, issues that Kate has already mentioned. We've just finished a report published very soon on skills shortages um, in Scotland, but recommendations of what to do about that, good practice examples, and through our very active Scottish group, uh, CPD workshops have been provided uh, on a range of useful topics. Um, in Northern Ireland, the uh, Department for Communities has uh, started the Way Forward for Archaeology project very much looking for a strategy for archaeology in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, it's very exciting. I'm just going to talk about a few things to highlight that um, the uh, Permanent Secretary has agreed that there can be changes to legislation just as soon as there's an assembly to do it, uh, and changes to planning guidance as well. So there really is an appetite for legal and planning reform. It's excellent news. Um, there is certainly discussion, I will say no more than, about it than that, because it, 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 all this needs to be consulted on, but we're certainly talking about making professional licensing organisations, as well as individuals, um, and uh, following the English model, looking at stage discharge of planning conditions to um, overcome the problem of uh, conditions being discharged before archaeological work is completed, particularly in the post-exercise of things. 
Um, and then trying to link the whole thing together through professional standards. Uh, so that's really encouraging development. And then um, in, in Wales, we continue to work um, with CADA. Uh, obviously, in the, the Act is, is, is an Act now, but there's a, a big implementation phase with a lot of secondary uh, legislation and guidance going through, which we're working with CADA on. Um, Tim has contributed to the sounding board on, on, for, for the planners. There's an awful pun in there if you want to work on it, Tim. Um, and also uh, the Law Commission review of planning law in Wales. So big emphasis on, on, on planning in Wales. And once again, CADU have proved really good colleagues to work with, um, with a genuinely engaging, listening approach. Moving beyond the UK, um, our, our colleagues, the Register of Professional Archaeologists, uh, Christopher Dorr, the President, is here today. Um, we're working with them on skills issues, CPD courses, promoting ethical competence, and indeed an ethics workshop which is in here on Friday morning. So again, that will be a, a, a quite an exciting and, and new development for a CIFA conference. Um, Institute of Archaeologists of Ireland, uh, we have had a, a memorandum of understanding with them and not surprisingly because of the developments in the north, um, the alignment of our standards both for people, process and for product uh, is an important part of what we need to do over the next year. Uh, the European Association of Archaeologists, we have a memorandum with them, an understanding uh, and uh, we're, we're working well with them and they have been very good colleagues helping us promote uh, the Institute across the continent of Europe. And finally, in Germany, Deguf have proved brilliant partners. Deguf is a learned society and in a survey of its members a few years back, um, the members said, we want a professional institute. We want you to become a professional institute. We need a professional institute for archaeologists in Germany. And they said, no, 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 no. That mix, mix, that's just mixed messages. We're a learning society. We're not a professional institute. And then the members said, yeah, but we want a professional institute. So brilliantly, what their leaders said was, well, OK, let's see if we can find you one. And they very kindly invited CIFA to speak to colleagues in Germany. Um, which led to CIFA Deutschland, at which point I will hand over to my new colleague, Michaela, who will tell you all about CIFA Deutschland. Hi, nice to meet you all. I just want to give you a short insight what happened in Germany, how we ended up with having CIFA Germany, what we are doing in the moment and what we are going to do in the future. Or hoping to do. So, last year there was a great discussion about, in February starting, that we need a professional association in Germany. And then CIFA came and offered to support to build a German branch in June. Then we had a meeting of archaeologists, or one of the biggest meetings we have in Germany, in Mainz last year. And Jerry was there and we had an evening event where he told the people what CIFA is, what they want to do and that they want to support us in Germany to have CIFA over there in our own scheme. So they said we have all the system, we have the accreditation system, we have the code of conduct, we have all these guidelines and we would like to support you to adopt it in Germany. And there were about 50 members or Germans who said, we would like to become members, we're interested in doing that, and Jerry announced me as coordinator then. The next step was that in November we had enough members and we had a working committee, so we could hand on a proposal that we want to be recognized by the board as area group, which then happened that February. So we are now officially an area group of CIFA, which we are really proud of, because it didn't take us that long to get there. And now we will have in May our first AGM where we have to vote our committee and we will talk about what happened and what will happen in the future. And to let you know more about that, I just want to do a quick run through what in more detail happened. So as I said, we started in July 
And there we started to talk about how do we want to do things. And the first thing was, well, we need things in German, because otherwise they won't understand it. So at first we wrote a letter to the members to be, so to the people who are interested, to explain to them what CIFAR is, what we are going to do, and that it's not an English group going into Germany and saying, hey, there's a system, just take it. But it is a German group that wants to establish this system in Germany and adopt it. And then by the end of July, we already had our nice logo finished, and we had a website that was written in German, and a Wikipedia article, what's really important in Germany, so people can Google us and find us. <laughs> then in September, I visit the UK just to learn more about CIFA, to learn how to talk about it, to learn how to promote it to people, and to support the German group. <coughs> then by the end of September, we wrote the second letter to members to, D, to be because I visit the accreditation committee and now I wanted to tell them more about how the system works, that it's really good for all of them, that it's based on the matrix of competences so everybody knows what's going on there. And I wanted to tell them that we have the documents already translated which they need for accreditation and the matrix of competences. So we really could start then to have German members. But also we needed to make sure that the accreditation committee can understand what's coming in there because then it's in German. So CIFO agreed to have a translator working on that and we agreed to support them with people who can understand the German system. Then in November, Gary and I published an article to explain again to the public what are the benefits of CIFO, what are we going to do, what are the next plans, so everybody knows. And we have something we can refer to because if we have some political issues, we can say, we said everything, it's there, you can read it. In November, we had the first meeting of CIFA Deutschland committee. So we found a group that really wanted to do something, and we have a quite good mix in the moment. We have a state archaeologist, we have two heads of commercial companies, we have a freelancer, we have one guy from university, we have people who are employed in companies, and we have me. So there are a lot of people doing a lot of great stuff. Um, so in November, we could then hand on our application to Pete, so it can go to the board. And it took about February, because not all of the guys we needed were already accredited, so it took some time. But there we had enough members, which is really great, because we had 30 then, or about 30. In December, me and two guys of the committee were at a meeting of the Bavarian companies where we had the opportunity to speak to them and hand out flyers. So this was the first time for us to really talk to the guys who work in archaeology, at least in Bavaria, that this was important for us. And in January, we built our first working group. We had our heads of uh, the commercial companies really do great work because we need to have registered organizations in Germany, but we can't just take the English system. It doesn't work in Germany, so we have to adopt things, and they are working a lot on that in the moment. We also had the Code of Conduct translated, which was really important because accredited members agree to it, so they need to have it in German. In February, we started our second working group, which mainly focused on giving a course or a lecture for freelancers on how to design a contract, how to make calculations, because most of archaeologists start as freelancers and don't know anything about that. So it's important to train them in this way. And we had the application for students and affiliates translated and online too. In March, we were at one of the biggest meetings of archaeologists we have in Germany, and this was really, really helpful because we could talk to many people guys from university, students, freelancers, everybody was there. And so we got a quite good feeling what they fear, what they wish, what we can do, and how we can talk to them now. So this really helped. And then we also built a new working group named Training Profession, because we have all these guys coming out of university, but most of them never were at field work. So it's really difficult for the companies to find people who really know what they're doing and we have no training program in the moment. So this is our third working group, and this is really enough for the moment, so we're fo focusing on these three things. And 
As Pete already mentioned, we're working closely together with EGUF, but it is politically important to really state that we are different groups. We want to achieve similar things somehow, but we are going different ways and we have different groups. And this will take a lot of pressure from us when we just have something where we can show that no, we're different. Just to let you know our members, we started with one in July, that was me. And um, in December we already had 20, and now we're up to 50. So we're really growing, and we're really thankful that you support us, that CIFA supports us, that we have the chance to adopt the system in Germany. So really thank you from our members and from the committee. Thanks. Thank you, Michaela. That was superb. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have uh, eight minutes impossible to condense CIFA's policy achievements. Uh, the big screens below are showing six to four against me having any chance of doing that. So we better get cracking. Uh, let me see. Policy achievements and challenges. Uh, start with a little bit of CPD on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, I've characterised our work over the past 12 months as consolidation, promotion, you can see where this is going, uh, nothing particularly clever here, and defence. Uh, I'll unpack this quickly, just in slightly more detail. Peter and others have already uh, alluded to a number of these things. Um, we live in a world beset by troubles and woes. Uh, I can be as pessimistic as the next man or woman. Uh, and I think it is important at the outset to recognise that over recent years there have been a number of positive developments. We've talked about a number of them. I'll quickly name check them. Progressive Act in Wales uh, in 2016, amongst other things, uh, uh, long-awaited statutory duty for historic environment records. We've also talked about Scotland, Scottish, uh, Scottish archaeology strategy and our place in time. Really important documents providing a framework for us to build on and consolidate. Um, in England, let's not forget in the planning sphere, um, we worry a lot, but we have a planning framework uh, uh, and, and planning guidance and good practice advice and advice notes sitting below that, which generally, I would suggest, are fit for purpose. Uh, there are a lot of uh, threats, a lot of w worries, but we have a basis that has been, with the help of the sector, established over recent years. I'll, I'll come on to what we need to do about that. Um, we have in Northern Ireland, you may say, well, that's going back a little bit. The, um, the Planning Act, we're being recorded, so I have to watch what I say here. The Planning Act, Northern Ireland, 2011, uh, devolving um, planning responsibility, uh, as in the rest of the UK, to local authorities from central government. A 2011 Act, but a, a, quite a seismic change in Northern Ireland, and, and those planning provisions only came into force 1st of April 2015. So still a lot of work to be done there. Um, and we have also, just to remind you again going back, the original Westminster Act, the Marine uh, and Access Act 2009, and devolved equivalents. And we are still uh, really seeing the unfolding of marine spatial planning and marine licensing, along with uh, another, a lot of areas of protection in the maritime world. So we've had a lot to do in the last 12 months to try and build on those very positive uh, benefits that we've had. Um, what about promotion? Well, the easy bit, even in the office we can work this out, if it's got historic environment or archaeology in the title, it's a fair clue that we should have something to say about it. More difficult, I have to say, is when we get to more general matters. Um, European Union withdrawal bill, uh, Brexit uh, more commonly, but in its wake we're getting an agriculture bill, we're getting marine fisheries bill. Uh, we have to try and insert ourselves into that sort of legislation or at least into the uh, secondary legislation and the policy that, that follows after it. Planning, another major topic as you, many of you probably know close to my heart, we've got a Planning Scotland bill, 
We've got Charles Miner's review of planning through the War Commission in Wales. We've got the Rainsford review of planning in England. Everything potentially changing. And let me say immediately, we've been criticised in almost all these areas for seeking to draw undue attention to archaeology and the historic environment. I'll say immediately, I take that as a compliment. And I would suggest that, that is exactly what we need to do in the coming year. So promotion, they're important. Defence, what we have, we hold. Um, they say that Leonid Brezhnev never said that about his views on socialism, but, but why spoil a good story? Um, the threats are well known. Uh, three of them there, we could uh, spend five minutes un unpacking a, a whole host of them. Deregulation, lack of resources and Brexit. Just to pick three at random. Um, we're striving to hold the line in all these areas, maintaining local government resources, uh, revising NPPF in England, and again, we talked about conditions, the Neighbourhood Planning Act. Again, to many of you, possibly a, a quite a techie, anarchish thing, but again, it, it, it's one of the building blocks that ensures that we get from your expertise public benefit, and if we are not careful, we will lose it. Um, Challenges. I, I, I've run through some of the challenges already. I, I, I won't in my time, and I seem to be going quite well, to be fair, rather than the direct policy challenges. Now, we've, particularly since Charter, been growing and maturing as an institute. Um, I have to say, one of the personal challenges that we face is it's been made clear to uh, members of staff, particularly myself, that it is inappropriate for an august body such as us to, to cull illicit images from the internet to, uh, to, to populate our presentations. It was difficult for me, but my younger colleagues in the office said that's not a problem. They said there are many open access resources, and you just go into the internet, type in what you want, and there will be a plethora of photographs. So, a courtesy of an open access site on Splash, um, we have a photograph of the late Peter Postlethwaite, what in my view is one of uh, uh, England's greatest actors. Um, it, it must have been in his younger days, but that is what I got when I typed into Open Access Peter Postlethwaite. Um, <laughs> why have I given you a picture of a young Peter Postlethwaite minus his head? Well, I wanted to sum up in one image uh, the passion which many of you probably all of you have, and certainly many of my colleagues have, for archaeology and the historic environment. Uh, and it's become a dilemma for us because that passion has been um, set against our attempts at times, we talk about a sea for voice, to portray ourselves as a mature, authoritative body. And uh, my second photograph, uh, again from open access, this is a photograph of Mark Rylance, I am assured. Uh, in my view, our uh, greatest living actor. Uh, and uh, again, what a ranting. Uh, uh, Danny, who is Pete Postlethwaite, gives a legendary rant, uh, uh, lamenting the, uh, the death of an industry, in that case the coal industry. Uh, all in the name of progress and all for a few lousy bob. Sound, sound familiar to you? It's the passion that many of you have and the cynicism that can infect us all. Um, why Mark Rylance? Well, a much later film, very recent, Bridge of Spies, a story about Rudolf Abel, interesting chap, fascinating in fact. Willie Fisher, many of you may know, brought up in, uh, in Tyneside. Uh, but ended up as a, a, a Russian spy in New York in the late 50s, uh, captured, and his story told in the film Bridge of Spies. Ultimately, he was swapped for Gary Powers. Uh, Tom Hanks plays the famous lawyer, James Donovan, in the film. And when uh, Rudolf Abel is on, on, on trial for his life, we forget this, the Rosenbergs went to the electric chair in the 50s. Uh, he was facing the electric chair, and Tom Hanks, the character, continually says to him during the trial, you don't seem worried. And the response which uh, Mark Rylance, as, as Rudolf Abel, gives to each question is, would it help? 
And it does sum up, to me, the dilemma we have. Uh, many of my younger colleagues are, are outraged at some of the things that go on. They say, I I've never seen anything like it in my life, to which I always say, you need to get out more. Uh, we live in a wicked world, and you should never be surprised by what's happening. But that's a real issue. You know? Do we have passion or poise? And, and you might be surprised, we've gone out to PR people. How do we, how do we cultivate the, the C for voice? They said to us, what you need is passionate authority. I thought, I'm in the wrong business here. Uh, yeah, this, this is easy money. Uh, ecologists said, uh, heart in the oven and uh, head in the fridge. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult domestic plumbing job, but I think it is possible, uh, and I'm going to leave you, possibly characteristics, with, with another great man, who perhaps was even more elegant than Rudolf Abel in this trial, uh, that's uh, Mandela. Again, on trial for his life, again, I could bore you for it, survivorship bias is, is a really interesting thing. We, we assume that, that the survival of people like Mandela was inevitable. Uh, it, it wasn't. He survived and he was lucky. The smart money was that he would go to the gallows uh, when he faced his trial in the 1960s. Uh, when he gave his closing speech, he was looking at the hangman's noose, but he calmly set out uh, the creed uh, which he followed. And he finished with the words, and uh, I'm going to finish with, with them now, and I commend them to you for the coming year for the battle. He said, these are the principles by which I live. Uh, and if necessary, they're the principles for which I'm willing to die. And he said that with a straight face. I would have been more than Groucho Marx, I feel. I have principles, but if you don't like them, don't worry, I have others. But uh, <laughs> there it is. We do have a great challenge. I do feel we have achieved a lot over the year, but there is still a, a lot to do. So uh, I leave you with a great man and a great fight. And uh, I hand over to the person you've all been waiting for, our chair, uh, 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 Victoria. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. It's uh, hard to know how to talk, Tim. <laughs> I got the short end of the straw, I think, having to follow you there. Well, thanks very much for what we've heard so far. I think what I just wanted to reflect on was where we're going next. So we talked a lot there about what we've done over the last year. And I think it's really important that we sort of, uh, we took stock when I came in in uh, October, November at the AGM. I think we had a bit of a rocky road uh, around that time. We had conversations about individual chartership and we perhaps had not been that great at showing how we'd got to where we'd got to. So whilst people have been beavering away, doing an awful lot of work behind the scenes and, and taking into account lots of things that people were telling us about what they wanted to see, that perhaps wasn't necessarily reflected back to everybody in terms of communication. So I guess what I've come in as new chair, and the one thing that I'm really keen that we do is we talk really uh, closely with you as a wide constituency of people. So we need to talk to everybody on different levels and reflect the fact that we have a really wide demographic in our membership of three and a half thousand or thereabouts. So really what I'm here today to ask you to do, as the body of people who are here, but also those who are outside of this room and those who will be contributing in other ways, is to try and engage with what we're talking about across the board. We've, we've seen what Kate has been doing in terms of the individual chartership, but also the other aspects of the work that the, the staff and others do in the organization. I think it's really important to remember that this is a professional institute and it's run by members for its members. It's not run by the staff who are just sort of there to keep things ticking along. We all have to engage with this as part of our, our institute and we are responsible for what happens next. Okay. So in that vein, we do have 11 staff, and they sit in Reading and, uh, and elsewhere, and they, and they kind of keep things ticking over. But actually, predominantly, the work that's done by the organisation is really, really fundamentally involved with the volunteers that, are, that contribute to what happens in the organisation. We have a board, an advisory council, and they are both meet at various times in the year, and it's, they have a, a, a makeup of various people from different levels within the organisations that they sit within, they come from 
contracting organisations, they come from local authorities, and they try and represent the views of both themselves and the people for whom they work. And there's always, and um, generally, uh, vacancies on all of these elements, and it's really important that we try and keep people engaged and involved in these things. So, as well as that, we have 19 special interests in area groups, four of them are area groups, that includes uh, Deutschland, obviously now, um, and in total, that means that there are around 225 volunteers uh, out of the 3,500. Uh, 3, so we do have a lot of people who are engaged in things, but clearly there's the capacity for more, especially given that we have got these vacancies. This work that Tim and Rob are now doing uh, in um, policy development is really fundamentally based around the experience which members can offer uh, to help them understand what the, what the pressures are, what the pinch points are, the risks and the failures and the things that they're trying to influence in government and beyond. So I know that Tim and, and Rob have a, a very good uh, a list which they circulate to people and they request views back, but certainly any additional people to join in with that sort of um, bit of work is always welcome because it's always about understanding what you as members or what we as members find important. I think what fundamentally we learned and we are trying to work on is that we want to listen and I think what Kate was talking about earlier in terms of how we have now developed further the idea about how we want to you know, chartership and that we're not rigorously sticking to timetables and that we're moving in accordance with how the mood is of the organisation, uh, that we're listening, we've learned from what's happened over last year and we are developing our responses and how we <coughs> operate as, as part of that. But ultimately, we as a body, we want to lead the profession. It's important that we're all part of that leadership and that we move on together. So, just in terms of this conference, what would be really handy is to try and understand better about what you as people here think that we ought to be doing differently or that we do well. So one of the things that we've, we've put together in the foyer is a, a stand, some of which is about chartership, but actually we'd quite like to take that further and talk to you and with you about what you think we should be doing more of and how we could do things better in terms of that. Should we be doing things differently, less of something? Should we be communicating with people in a different way? We do have, as I say, a, huge, a hugely varied demographic. We have people from young to old. And whilst I may not be in either group at the moment, kind of somewhere in the middle, I don't necessarily, I don't tweet. I'm not really into social media, but lots of people are. And so just making sure that we do actually access all of these different elements that people do want to use is really important. So young and old and middle people, please engage and help us to understand where we're missing a trick, I suppose, because we do want to capture information, we want to understand what it is that people are interested in and their worries and also the things that they think that we do well. So post-it notes uh, will be, a plethora of them are available in the foyer and really it's just a case of making either a visible comment or there are anonymous comment boxes available as well if you want to make a slightly different suggestion. Uh, with respect, obviously, um, <laughs> uh, and, be, and we will be around uh, at, at the stand over the next couple of days to just talk through with anybody about any concern, immediate concerns that we can help with, but we will be logging things to make sure that they influence uh, discussions later on in board and advisory council and elsewhere. So, we sped through that, which we didn't do too badly, I don't think, considering. We now have a bit of time for questions and discussion. And I'll open it to the floor, in which case.